Here's a look at the division algorithm for your viewing pleasure. I'm going to work a couple of toy examples and then think through a proof. So the division algorithm says let a and b be integers with b greater than zero. Well, there exists a unique q and r that are integers such that a equals b times q, we typically call it the quotient, plus r, which we typically call the remainder. And the remainder is greater than or equal to zero, but less than b. So uh, you maybe your, your classic example would be something like a is 13, b is 2, and so you would say, hmm, 13 equals how many twos? Well, six twos plus one left over. Notice the remainder is bigger than or equal to one and less than two. Uh, a little less typical but still possible is something like negative seven divided by four. Remember only the divisor has to be greater than zero. Uh, well, negative seven, I guess I'm going to have to have a negative number for q. If I put in negative two here, notice that's negative eight plus one equals negative seven. Well, one satisfies the remainder. Now, this theorem says a little more than I can just come up with negative two and one. It says they're unique. So uh, maybe you can convince yourself that in these two examples, those are the only ones. But that happens all the time, and that's what we're going to do in the proof here. Now, the proof is sort of a, a creative <clears throat> throwback to the well-ordering axiom. And here's sort of how it goes. Uh, uh, I usually write poof. Let a and b be integers with b greater than zero. Well, I'm going to come up with a set of somehow all the candidates for r. Now notice r is somehow the smallest non-negative element of something. And so here's the sort of creative technique. If you were trying to come up with a description of R, what would you do? Well, you'd take A, you'd subtract B times some other number. Well, Q is unique, so let me just put X in there, uh, such that X is an integer, okay? And um, let's also require that A minus BX is greater than or equal to zero. Okay, so notice that this is a subset of not just the integers, but the non-negative integers, so the natural numbers. So um, now this, this has real potential. This has R in it, assuming such an R exists, but I can't use the well-ordering axiom until I prove that um, S is non-empty. So here's going to be my technique. My technique is going to be show S is not empty, apply the well-ordering axiom. Well, that gives me for free this inequality here. Step two, show that R is indeed less than B. Uh, I get this for free by the definition of what this thing is. Uh, then I'm going to go over here and show that uh, any other choice for Q and R, we'll call them Q bar and R bar, are actually the same things. So. Step one, I guess step starts with an ST. Uh, step one, S is non-empty. Well, that's a little bit of a sticky wicket because I don't know whether A is positive or negative. So how can I tell you somehow common sense says, well, there should be something in here that's positive, but here's kind of a nice technique for doing that. I don't know whether A is positive, but I know the absolute value of A is positive. So what I can do is I can say uh, B is, got, of course, greater than or equal to 1. So that means B times the absolute value of A is greater than or equal to the absolute value of A, uh, which, of course, is greater than or equal to A itself. Well, if you have that inequality, uh, oops, and I'm not, I'm not thinking ahead enough. I actually want it greater than or equal to negative a, which should be true. Uh, of course, this is equal if a is negative. Uh, now, I'll just add a to both sides. What's that get me? That gets me 0 over here, and a plus b times
times the absolute value of a, right? So, let's see, what's that say? That says a minus b times negative the absolute value of a is an s. Huh, it's not empty. Isn't that kind of a cute trick? Okay, so step two. Uh, step two by the well-ordering principle, or the well-ordering axiom. Choose R in S, the smallest element. And we're going to sort of push against this, this condition over time. So the smallest element. Also choose Q in Z such that, well, R being in S and S being described like that means that um, there is some value Q that we can put in here. Therefore, Notice if we sort of reorganize this, therefore we get this condition up here that we were trying for. Therefore, A equals BQ minus, uh, sorry, plus R. So I've got that condition. Uh, notice that I've got this condition just simply by being inside S. That's a list of non-negative things. How do I get this condition? So step three is just showing that R is less than B, okay, then my step four is going to be uniqueness. So how do I show that? I say if R is greater than or equal to B, then uh, R minus B is greater than or equal to zero. Well, R minus B greater than or equal to zero says, um, hmm, then R minus B is a candidate for satisfying this condition. Uh, and R minus B equals A, let's see, well, a R was equal to A minus BQ minus B, which equals A minus B times Q plus one. Well, being in this format, means, hey, that's an element of S, as long as it's greater than or equal to zero. So, R minus B is an element of S. Well, that's a contradiction, right? That means that R isn't the smallest element. So, that's a contradiction. Therefore, uh, R can't be greater than or equal to B, so R is less than B. Okay, so, last step. Uniqueness Well, let's see. So what should we do here? I suppose what we ought to do is we ought to let uh, Q bar and R bar be in Z such that uh, A equals B Q bar plus R bar and 0 is less than or equal to R bar less than B. What I'd really like to show is I'd like to show Q bar equals Q and R bar equals R. Uh, hmm, so what can I do with that? Well, since this thing's equal to A and the other thing's equal to A, kind of stands to reason that what I do is I'd say BQ plus R equals BQ bar plus R bar. Um, that implies that uh, I guess if I pull this over to the other side, I have, let's see, maybe, maybe I'll put it over on this side, which side would I like it on? I'll put it over here. Uh, so I've got Q minus Q bar, a little basic factoring, then putting this over on the other side, I've got um, R bar minus R. Okay, well, um, since both R and R bar are less than 
are less than um, b, right? I have, uh, let's see, I have zero is less than r bar, less than or equal to r bar is less than b. Okay, well now I'm going to subtract um, r from all of these things. Well, so subtracting r from all of these things right, means that, uh, let's see, well I know that r has magnitude less than um, less than b, so this thing has to be greater than negative b. It can't get down to negative b. It also um, it also can't get bigger by subtracting something that's non-negative. So I'm sort of stuck between these two things. Hmm. So well, what what could we do there? Um, think about that. Well, what's, what's this actually equal to? Well, I'm going to go back here and I'm going to say, well, what are these things actually equal to? Um, let's see. Uh, R bar is equal to um, A minus B Q bar, right? Minus A minus B Q and perhaps you can sort of see where I'm going here. Uh, well, the a's cancel out, so I've got negative b is less than, and sorting through my negatives, b q minus q bar is less than b. Notice I've got a b in all the terms, so that means negative 1 is less than q minus q bar is less than 1. Maybe take some time to, to think through that if you don't believe it. Uh, well, these are integers, right? So this is an integer. It's greater than negative 1, less than 1, therefore q equals q, oh, sorry, q minus q bar equals 0, right? Uh, well, what's that mean? Therefore, q equals q bar. Okay, well then, going up to these descriptions, uh, if you have, um, maybe I should take this one, Therefore, r equals r bar, and they are unique. So that is the proof. Uh, going back up to the top, uh, we've, we've demonstrated that there are unique q and r, such that this condition holds and that condition holds. So I'll put a box and call it done.